to welcome all of you once again. This is our um, weekly forum. We have this forum every Sunday at 7.30. That's 7.30 in the night for us. I know we cannot satisfy everybody who live in all parts of the world, especially in the, the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, for some people, uh, like if you're in England, I think it's uh, probably midnight. And if you're in India, it's probably the wee hours of the morning and all kinds of things like that, depending on the time zone in which you live. So um, in Trinidad, it's um, about 7.30 now. And this is the time that we have our weekly forum. Um, and we talk ab uh, every week about on a variety of topics that are topical and that are current. But we deal with burden issues and we deal with topics that are probably too politically incorrect to deal with. So this uh, uh, program is being produced by ICDN, Indo-Caribbean Diaspora News. It's a free online newspaper. And I ask, I'm inviting all of you to, those who can write, to submit articles not more than 800 words long. The focus must be on Indians and the perspective must be an Indian one. And submit your, your articles and we are going to um, upload it and, and, and distribute it globally. Right, it's a free online paper, ICDN. Uh, this program is being streamed live on our Facebook page and it's being recorded on YouTube, but we usually edit it before we upload it on YouTube. It's important for, for us to have records of the program for, for research and other reasons. Um, I've already uh, asked you to mute your microphone to prevent the background noise because sometimes it can be very irritating. And um, I don't really want to put anybody out of the meeting, which I, I can do as a host if, it's, if you continue to interrupt everybody and distract them and so on. Um, I would like everybody to, who, who is speaking to identify yourself briefly. Um, tell us your name and what country you are from and uh, just briefly in, in, in half a minute. And then you can ask your question or make a comment or make a contribution. So uh, this evening, the talk is again on Guyana. It's a burning issue. issue. It's streaming live in all, all the networks. Um, and uh, we don't really want to talk about the past of Guyana. We all know about the past of Guyana with Burnham and so on and Hoyt unless, so you dwell on, you deal with the past, you make references only to the past, only if it's going to give your point leverage. So we are going to talk about the future. So this program uh, is, is forward looking, forward thinking, and uh, we are going to address issues various scenarios, what if? What if the CCJ rules against the PVP? Um, I see I have a problem here with the 40 minutes because, um, so I will have to, all right, if, if we get disconnected in any way, I, I, I will um, reconnect because something happened that I said the tech guy is not here and just hang on. Sometimes when rain falls, we get disconnected with the internet and so on. And, um, and, and, and uh, just hang on and we'll reconnect with you. Um, okay. So, just hold a second. Right, so what if, what if the GCOM chairman, Torit Singh, gives Granger the government? What if Granger himself does not want to step down? What are the possibilities? And um, how are you going to address these various scenarios? So first we have uh, uh, Mr. Gibran and who is going to, to um, introduce yourself briefly. 
and um, you can proceed. So um, you can un unmute your mic, doctor, and uh, proceed. Dr. Daniel Gibran, Emeritus Professor in the, of International Relations and Intelligence Studies. Yes, so you have about seven minutes to talk. Uh, please, um, please time yourself and uh, stop when you are done. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I was looking forward to setting an epistemological background in order to understand David Granger and his thinking and how his ideas were incubated um, during the Burnham era and especially during his time in the military. I served with him in the military, so I know him fairly well. Um, and how he was infected with Burnham's thinking. Well, it wasn't he alone, it was also Vincent Alexander. So right now we have a, uh, a president in waiting and we have someone in GCOM who is a commissioner um, uh, in GCOM. Uh, both are synchronized in their thinking with respect to the Burnham ideology. This ideology makes um, three or four assumptions. One is the primacy of the political party. I notice Burnham didn't give his party in, uh, the nomenclature of party, his National uh, People's National Congress. If you look at the dictionary definition of Congress, you will see it also means an organization of like-minded people. That is very important to bear in mind. Um, secondly, the primacy of this party trumps the state. Another assumption, uh, I don't have time to get into these assumptions in much detail, uh, given the time constraints, so I'll just list them. The second assumption is, it is more sociological and cultural. Although Burnham you know, um, refrained openly from discussing race and ethnicity, among his own people, individuals who know him fairly well of his own ilk, they, they were amazed to hear some of the views that he ventilated about race. He was very um, askance about Indians and Portuguese, always saying, you know, that these individuals captured the commanding heights of the economy, so on and so forth. So his plan would be to use state power through the instrument of the PNC so that he has individuals placed in certain organizations or certain ministries, what have you, of the state in order to bring this about. And there are a number of things that he did also. All right, let me move on to, to address the question now. So, how do we understand David Granger? David Granger holds on tenaciously to the belief, just like Forbes Burnham, that once you get into power, which Burnham did in 1964, and by 1968, when he kicked the gear out and was able to manipulate the electoral machinery and continue to, to do this until he died in 1985, he famously said that once you're in power, there is no reason for you to lose political power. We see that behavior being manifested in Granger's disposition, things that he would say, how he would act, so on and so forth. All right. Um, so we must know how Granger's thinking has been influenced and how far he has gone now in embracing that ideology, that political social ideology, which he got from Burnham. Now, the question is, what if Claudette Singh declared the election for 
David Granger or Apno. There are many who share that view. I am one of those who do not share that view. Initially, perhaps that was before the recount, it was highly plausible that this could have been possible. Um, but after the recount, and we read her statements where she quoted the law copiously, it is very clear to me that she will not declare this election for APNU. If that were the case, she would have done it way before. Granger would not accept it either because Granger is fully aware of the ramifications and, um, and the backlash and the consequences that will be unleashed on himself, his team, as well as on the people and the state of Guyana. So I doubt very much that Burnham, uh, I'm sorry, that David Granger, um, even if the implausible event should take place, that Claudia Singh overruled her prior disposition and statements and call the election or declare with David Granger and Apnu the winner of the 2020 election. I doubt whether David Granger will accept it. Twice he refused to be sworn in. David Granger, in as much as he's surrounded by this cacophony of, you know, um, empty noises and whatnot, and now and again we see flashes of what we would describe as a flamboyance of idiocy. He's not that stupid. He, 19, uh, 2020 is not 1968. So what Barnum got away with for a number of years, Granger in 2020, cannot get away with these things because of the environment we are living in now. People of Indian ethnic origin are much more informed. They are more savvy. They are not as docile politically, most of them, as our parents and grandparents. We have Indians now who are much more attuned to what is going on, and they are very determined, along with afro Guyanese as well, that this cannot continue. The international community will not stand for it. And my last point on this, the monies that have been paid into the account by ExxonMobil is held in the Federal Reserve Bank in Manhattan. Whatever monies come in from subsequent um, tranches um, from the oil, the United States will not release that money if Granger is president, and Granger knows that. And the United States will not stand by to see country like Guyana, where they now have renewed interest, given what is taking place in Venezuela. So this is the geopolitical issue here, that the United States will not stand idly by. Now, however you want to give you a scenario, but I think my time is up. So I thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, but you can also, always come back later during the Q&A um, to develop your points or to add new points. So um, we move now to uh, Ms. Janet Naidu, who is Guyanese living in Canada. And many uh, persons who in literature would know her as a poet. She is also a writer and um, has studied political science. So over to you, Janet. Just unmute your mic and you can begin. Okay, okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. Um, I, I also share the view that um, uh, Claudette Singh, I doubt, will uh, declare Granger the winner. And the reason I'm going on this, although I will comment on your question, what if? 
But for now, I'd like to go down the road of why I believe she would not, is that, and it was said earlier, she had um, moments before where she could have done it and she did not de make the declaration. And in fact, um, before Mr. Granger actually um, suggested for CARICOM to uh, come, uh, invite CARICOM to uh, be a, a scrutineer in a recount, I recall her casually mentioning on just outside of the court that when Mingo did his second declaration that, uh, oh, maybe we should have a recount. And um, so she was entertaining that thought as well. Um, before it even got started. And um, this, this, there's a heavy reliance on CARICOM's role in this recount. And another point about this is that the recount showed that it, the, 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 the votes were identical to the SOPs that Mingo fraudulently um, uh, submitted to the commission. And, and so we've seen a lot what has gone on with the courts, sending him back to uh, use the SOPs, and yet he provided incorrect and fraudulent counts, vote counts, and she did not, she did not act upon it. Um, but there's no telling what can be happened. But I think the weight is um, in favor of her not uh, making a declaration until she gets something a little bit more solid. And this is why I think she sent Lowenfield to, um, to um, uh, provide her with the number of seats. Now this part is a little bit um, difficult to understand. Um, and I don't have the answer for this is that could she have really made the declaration without the number of seats? and then provide an opportunity for the seats to be confirmed later because she already had the vote. She had the recount total. So that's something that I would like to be up for discussion um, as to whether she could have made the declaration without having him go back to do the recount and to give him 48 hours to do that. Uh, that was also a bit questionable. Um, Sorry, sorry, I didn't realize that was videos off. Uh, so, so now we're on to the question of what if she does give Granger? Well, of course, we know that Guyana will be in a, a, a crisis. There will be protest. Uh, this cannot be. The world, is, uh, the world is watching and the world knows that the PPP won the elections. And the first count with the SOPs, the recount with the SORs, and now we're with the CCJ. And if the CCJ were to rule against the PPP, it will go back into the commission's court um, to proceed with that stage that they started with, with Lowenfield. Uh, and so that's what, where my, my mind is going is that I, I don't see her giving Granger this election. And, and he, uh, you know, um, Mr. Grobran also said this, Mr. Granger himself um, the, uh, asked for the recount. He, he, he would refuse it. Um, so I don't see that happening. And I, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. So, um, I'm hearing a background sound. Make sure that your mic is off. Is it uh, Cyril? Cyril, could it be Cyril? Just check your your, your mic. Um, I'm, I'm tr trying to see who is it. Right. Okay. So our um, uh, Dr. Ramharak uh, could not be with us, unfortunately. He had committed himself, and then. This morning, he messaged me to say he's unable to do so. So in his place, I would um, ask Dr. Tara Singh to um, give a seven minutes uh, presentation. So Dr. Tara Singh, as most people would know, is a columnist in one of the popular newspapers in the New York, and he has been a 
lecturer in sociology, I think, at UG sometime. And he resides now in New York. So over to you, Tara. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good evening to all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I start, I just want to give a little background of the, um, the data, the actual situation, because people are not too clear on that. Now, the total votes counted in the recount was 460,352, of which the PP got 203,306, and the PNC 217,920. The difference between those two parties is about 3.5%. Now, as you know, this is the only election in the world where you have six different sets of figures given. One was an election day, then the other was on 5th of June when Mingo made his first declaration. Then the other one was the 13th of June when Ming Mingo's second declaration came into existence. Then you have the recount. Then you have Loan Fields figure of the 13th of June and the 23rd of June. Now, I just want to say briefly on his 13th of June declaration, he he wiped up 275,092 votes from all the political parties with the PPP suffering the most. He chopped off 76% of the PPP vote, 42% of their own PNC vote, and 60% for the smaller parties combined. In the 23rd uh, declaration that he made, he's a, a little more generous. He chopped off 21.2% from the PNC, 28.7% from the PVP and 30.3% from the others group. In other words, a total of 115,844 votes he invalidated. He invalidated. He had no authority to do that. He was just asked to submit a report based on the recount. But he went farther into an area to disenfranchise all his people. Only a court of law can investigate into the legal or legality of an act. So he exceeded that. Now, in relation to what the two previous speak, I, I totally agree with him. It's very hard for Justice Father Singh because that memoranda or that affidavit that she supplied to the Guyana Court of Appeal clearly stated her position. Not only that, she asked that that suit bought by Ms. David, that that should be withdrawn, dismissed, it has no merit. And she being a lawyer, I think she can be very careful because her entire legacy depends on she making the correct decision. She knows that the PP won. From the 2nd of March, everyone knew that the PP won, all the political parties, including the PNC. Up to this day, the PNC cannot produce their statement of goals, and one has to answer why they are not producing it. They just can't keep it locked up at Congress face. Now, the, the Caribbean Court of Justice decision is very important. <clears throat> if it goes in favor of the PBP, it will strengthen Claudia Singh's hand in making a decision. If it goes the other way, she will be a little more disadvantaged, but yet, she has the deciding vote in that, and she can make the difference. So either way the CCG decision goes, it might not necessarily affect the decision of Kikom. Everything hinges on her, and being a liar, I think that she will make the right judgment, even though I know, I'm aware, that there's tremendous pressure on her to make a decision is anti-PPP. Up to today, one of the <laughs> regular uh, protagonists in New York is accusing her of siding with the PPP, etc. But you know, one of the fascinating things is that the array of fake news that is being spread and sending all kinds of misinformation to mislead people. But right now, I would say that the PP has the advantage 
And I fully agree with the four speaker. Just want to say something that brings it to what's in charge of the ideological training of the army. And he was also in charge of intelligence. So he knows quite a lot about how Bornham is thinking. But yet at the same time, neither Bornham nor Hyde ever made him a chief of staff. And there's a question mark, I don't know why. Probably Ravi Dev can comment on that and offer some suggestions. I'll stop here and um, I'll be willing to answer any other question later on. Right, so thank you very much, Tara, and thank you for um, agreeing to substitute for Dr. Amharak, who um, couldn't make it at the last minute. And our final speaker is um, Ravi Dev, well known, doesn't need an introduction, former MP um, of Guyana Parliament and Indian civil rights activist. So um, I'd like to give um, Ravi Dave a few extra minutes because he is on the ground. So over to you, Ravi. Unmute your mic and proceed. Yes, is Ravi there? Everyone, and um, yeah. I'm very happy to be uh, in this gathering here and to see some faces that I haven't seen for so many years. And as I mentioned to Janet earlier, that some of us uh, are still carrying uh, the good fight. Now, I really agree uh, totally with Professor Gibran's assessment <clears throat> of the ideological basis of what is going on here now, and to identify the ideology acting through a person. In situations such as we have now found ourselves, leadership is paramount. Leadership is paramount because this is how you have to make decisions, and it comes back to the leader, especially in a party where, um, like the PNC, where there's tradition is not only to be the paramount party, but to have a paramount leader. That is how it was, and it remains to this point. Now, I think we have to first, let's go back to the CCJ. And the CCJ will give its decision on Wednesday, and all Guyana is almost at a standstill, waiting to exhale, uh, waiting for Wednesday. But ultimately, and I think the other speakers who preceded me said it, to come down to what order the CCJ will give to GCOM in terms of the result. But I will all tell you ahead of time what will be the reaction of the PNC. It doesn't matter what the CCJ tells. And I think it is very clear what is the legal um, uh, order that ought to be given, that you must use the recount uh, numbers, because those were all turned valid, both in the, in the statement of recount and in the certificates of recount that summarize. So I believe that is what the order will say. But the PNC has already signaled what it will do, when Mr. Granger said he accepts already Lowen Fields cop numbers, to use the colloquial West Coast where I'm from. He's already said that. He has somersaulted from all his previous announcements, where he will go along with what the chair will say, what the chair will accept. And he is now, for the first time, says he accepts low in fields number. So he is the chair, but he will accept. Now whether the chair tells him to or, uh, that or not is not the issue. We, I am predicting they will, they, if the chair were to give an order, the PNC will say that order can only come to the institutional stipulation that the numbers must be provided by low in fields. That's a constitutional stipulation. It's in the statute, and it's confirmed that she must get her numbers from Lowenfield. Now, we may argue, as Janet did, that she already has those numbers. She has those numbers. She has access to 
of those numbers from the very beginning. But here again, you have this constraint that the law says it must come true low and field. And we know what low and field will do. He's already broken the law. Three charges, criminal charges for fraud has been filed, but those are scheduled on Friday. Up to Wednesday, whether he is served or not, he's in hiding. He will give the cocked up numbers, as I said. So, and if, and, and if they, and let's say if Scarlett were to denounce that, he will go to court and this matter will be dragged on. So I think in the proximate instance, the PNC will keep the ball in play, as they say in American football. And once the ball is in play, they are hoping that something will happen that will keep it in play. Um, but more importantly, is they, they're, they're expecting that the Americans will not apply sanctions once the matter is in the courts. Once the matter is in, in the courts, he has what I've always called a fig leaf of legality. And I believe that will be their move in the near term. But if we were to look beyond that, and the question would be how long can they carry on? How long can you go to the courts back and forth? Well, they have gone beyond what anybody else thought in the very beginning. When they could disobey a direct statement by Pompeo of this has gone on too long and do what they are doing, it means, as I said, they, they are, Granger is gambling for a resurrection. It's a term from game theory that when you see your, 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 your because your party is lost completely, then you lose nothing by going for it all. The old saying about you might as well be hung for a sheep than a lamb. And I think right now Granger is in that mode of gambling for survival, gambling for resurrection, hoping something will happen. Now all of us are giving credit to Granger for being a rational actor. That look how everything is stacked against you. But it was stacked against him from the very beginning. And I go back to what Professor Gibran has said, because it, it, it fits completely with my theory, that Granger from the age of 19 out of Queens was taken by Forbes, sent to Mons, come back, made an integral part of the party, of the army, which Burnham, uh, I beg to disagree with, with, with the professor, it was not the party that was central. The party already had people like Kennard and others who might have competed with, with, with Burnham. It was the army that he could control totally by moving aside some of the senior men and putting men like Granger. Remember in 79 when Rodney had infiltrated the army, it was, it was Granger who he put as the commandant of the forces and he brushed aside uh, Colonel Price and so many others. But to come back to the present, this is where I am a bit, um, a bit uh, confused by Professor Gibran. He says that Granger's position is as Forbes, that once you have power, you don't let go. As I have put it, Forbes had a Machiavellian conception of power, that legitimacy does not come out of, in those days, the people liking the prince. And in today, that whether the people vote for you or not, that, that your legitimacy, legitimacy comes from controlling the levels of power, raw power. And the moment Mr. Uh, Granger went into office, he augmented all the power centers, built up back the police force to full strength, 745 more individuals, brought back the people's militia, built back the, um, the army up, put people who he could control in the army and the police force, and only recently changed the new um, army head to an individual whom he has more confidence in. These are all signals that in controlling the power centers, traditionally it was those coercive forces, but then the bureaucracy we see his control, and even autonomous bodies like GCOM he controls, and, and, and we see now that the Court of Appeal will go along with him. So even more than Forbes, there is no J. Of, J. of Hales to go against him in the judiciary at the appellate level. So I believe for all those reasons, we can see that um, Granger, in my estimation, is going to gamble for resurrection and will not do 
the rational thing and step aside. Um, I will end with a quote from Forbes Burnham in his 1979 speech to the Congress, his PNC Biennial Congress. The same Congress where he told Rodney to make your will and our steel is sharper. Some of the, one of the committees was arguing about democratic procedure and Burnham said to them, said, comrades, y'all are reading on the lines and you have to learn to read between the lines. The point of the matter is Burnham has no, will give no shrift to, 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 to such matters like constitutional articles and all of that. It's all, that, it's all about power and he will hold on to power as his mentor Burnham said. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, for that profound analysis. So uh, the floor is open. Um, uh, remember to unmute your mic if you have to ask a question, make a comment or contribution. And this should be very brief because we have uh, 70, 70, 70 participants and I'm sure a fair number would like to talk. So uh, just briefly, yes. yeah, briefly. No. Yes, Mr. Moderator. This is a question, Mansra Ramphal Trinidad. This is a question for Professor Daniel Gibran. Is this a contest over money? You mentioned Exxon and monies in wait in the bank, or rather a matter awaiting a decision and Guyana moving forward and breathing again. Thank you. To answer you very succinctly, it's a little of all of those things that you so artfully mentioned. Um, I don't have to add any more to what you're saying, but I'd like to just go back very quickly since I have the mic with what um, my friend Ravi Dave said. Um, when Granger, well, just a little correction, Price had left a long time. Remember, he's an old man, and you know, he was coming uh, from the BGVF, which is the British Guyana Volunteer Force. When I joined the army, I was one among the first 32 men from Civilian Street who joined, and Granger came about six months after. Um, it's a little different um, in those days and the role he played. He was not a brilliant military officer or a strategist. He was what we call a mediocre officer. The, um, his colleagues in the officer corps did not like him because of his affinity to Bonamite ideology. He was more ideologically driven than anything else. And when the time was right, he, he became very open, meaning when all the expatriates left, the Guyana Defense Force after their tenure. Um, um, Granger became increasingly more brazen and more outspoken uh, in terms of his embrace of, of how Burnham was thinking or the Burnhamite ideology, those kind of things. Um, but to get back to the gentleman who asked the question, it's a little of all that you said. But we, we must not discard the important role um, um, of the economy of Guyana, that if, if Granger is allowed, all right, um, he continues to drag this thing on as if you know, there's a rope without an end, then what happens? Well, one is negating in, in that dichotomy that the United States will not act decisively. I believe that the United States will act very decisively. Um, there are steps or there are sanctions that the United States can apply and it is the State Department and the Department of Treasury that can apply these sanctions, particularly as it relates to cutting Guyana out from the SWIFT system, the SWIFT monetary system. So there are no transfers of foreign exchange into Guyana, which Guyana depends on. Um, in other words, they can strangulate Guyana economically. And uh, lastly, Jack Dale has, has indicated very clearly that he is not returning to parliament. 
which means no bills can be passed, no financial bills can be passed, no appropriations can be made. So he will continue to be a lame duck for a year, two years maybe. I doubt it very much. Thank you. That, thank you. Um, right, so if you have a question, comment, contribution, unmute your mic and be very brief, please. I have a question for Ravi Dev. Yes, go ahead. I'm Omkar Prasad. Um, Ravi, you're saying that the Constitution, where law in fields numbers, does the commission, because I, my understanding is that the previous commissioner had instructed Boudou to re restructure his, his presentation or his submission. Does the commission have to accept law in fields submission? Because they said it has to be discussed before they accept. Does the commission have to accept law in fields submission? Yeah, your mic, uh, Ravi, you have to unmute your mic. Yeah, in my opinion, I don't think so, but that is how it is stated. And as you said, there is precedent in 2011 when Alexander interrogated uh, Guru and one seat was shifted. So there is that present within GCOM. But my remarks were guided by what the PNC will do, what Granger will do. I am predicted as they've done in the past to take when you didn't think even there was a sliver of, an, of a chance to go to the courts, they, they do and just to delay matters. So I am saying that if the PNC were in, so inclined to go along with the law, which they haven't shown since uh, December 21st, 2018, when the no confidence motion was uh, passed, uh, then all will be well. But I don't believe they will go along. They will find that ruse to go to the court to say, well, the, the, um, the, the, what do you call it? The um, Constitution says this, and GCOM can't connive among themselves to alter the Constitution. It's an arguable point where I believe that uh, since they will invoke once again that it has to do with the election of a president, Article 1774, they can then go now again to the appellate court where they will get a favorable hearing and you have this merry-go-round circle once again. That is my surmise, reading from what they've done in the past and projecting that forward. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, uh, anybody again? Um, remember to unmute your mic so we can hear you. Dave, I see you talking. You have to yeah. unmute and be very short, yeah. please. Yeah, Kumar. You uh, okay, hear me? okay, okay, go ahead. Yes. You hear me? Yes, yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead, okay. Tara. Tara. There has, been, there has been a request from one of the parties to fire Long and Peel. It's within the commission authority to fire him and to get a replacement. So that, that could be done if the chairman so decides. So that can avoid that problem that Ravi Dave is talking about. Um, if you fire, fire him and get somebody else to serve in that capacity, that person can present a report to GCOM. And there has been a formal request made by one of the parties. I don't know if any other has joined them, but it was disclosed publicly today. If I might, Kumar, yes, sure, Tara sure. is absolutely correct that it made, and there is that possibility. But here again, Granger, in playing chess, had Jikam on the Patterson, whom he placed there unilaterally. This man did this a year and a half ago to not hire Vishnu Prasad who was the most qualified position for the deputy CEO position. And they put in instead Roxon Myers, who was shown to be an even more strident uh, supporter of the PNC's um, position. So if uh, Lowenfield is, is fired, and I hope he is because um, there's also these this charges, uh, Roxon Myers will immediately uh, be performing those functions as for per the rules of, of um, GCOM, and she is even worse than Lonefield. 
Good. But if okay. Okay. Go ahead. A specific instruction from the chairman, I want you to prepare a report based on the figures shown up by the recount. What happened then? Okay, what they have argued, and this is, they have put this down in writing when I say they're PNC. They are saying if the constitution and the statute both say that the, the chairman should act upon the advice of the CEO, then the constitution would not make an oxymoric statement to wit that the, the, the chairman can advise herself. Well, then why even have the CEO? If the, if, the, if, if the chairman can advise and instruct. That is why they have been very careful, all of the parties in Ghana have been very careful not to use the word instruct. They are saying she should ask Lowenfield. But, but, but the point is, they say, I we come back to the main actor who wants to put a spanner into these words, the PNC, and they will go to the courts and say, you are instructing him. And constitutionally, uh, he, you're, you're, uh, putting your, your knee on his neck, and he can't breathe. But the, 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 the question is, law and field figures are based on the observation report, and there was no obligation or no authority for him to do that. That's outside his statutory duty. He was just to prepare a summary of all the observation reports, but not to create his own fictitious figures. And that is the crux of the problem. And that is the crux of the problem that will remain and, and is part of Guyana's problem, that when you have institutions that are supposed to be independent, when you have the, the primary institution of the Constitution to which leaders like Granger are supposed to adhere, when they will not even act, when the Constitution is clear that the on the passage of a no confidence motion, you resign. Even the CCJ said, you don't need any gloss, any explanation for that, yet they will take that strength. So the point I'm saying, uh, Tara, in, in the real politic that the PNC practices, they, they give very short shrift or any shrift to these legalities. Burnham would just snicker. You know, and he always laughed at, 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 Chetty, about, uh, at Chetty about this. And I'll give, leave you this last historical incident. In 1962, when they were supposed to go up to London to talk about new constitutions, and Chetty had Fenton Ramsohoy create a whole new constitution and what have you, Chetty uh, Burnham couldn't be bothered. He said, I don't care what constitution I'm given. Once we get independence, I can change it to my liking. That is his position, and that is the, that is his acolyte Granger's position on these documents. Imagine a man like Granger could tell the chief justice of this land when she ruled against um, uh, Patterson, but that is your perception. I have my, you will tell the judiciary that you, that is your perception when that is a co-equal branch of the state, that, but that's the measure of the people we're dealing with. Thank you. I, I, thank you. Uh, um, so I'd, like to, I'd like to pick up on uh, the thread from Ravi. Um, the, 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 the assumption that, um, that we, a lot of the conversation is that we're dealing with principled and rational people. And as Ravi pointed out, that is not necessarily the case. So, so, so if we could get back to the two um, uh, points of the, um, the, the discussion. What if Singh goes rogue or Granger seizes the government? And if Singh goes rogue, I see it as an extension of, um, there is some degree of legal coverage that just draws this thing out. And I'd like to get an opinion on it. If Granger goes rogue, it will be a situation like Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela has, has been, uh, I, I mean, they're in bad shape, but they, but they have endured the sanctions and they have had the help of the Russians and the, and the Chinese to sell their, their oil. Although we know the, the problems of uh, tankers out at sea without the port to call on. 
but but nevertheless, that that that, that is that is a pathway that uh, that Granger could be looking at to thumb his nose at the uh, at the Americans, and uh, and and the and depend on support from the, the Chinese and Russians, at least for some period, until um, this thing is all, everybody gets exhausted and um, and and sort of forget in a sense of, of what he's done. So I, I'm looking for um, the, the what if scenario, what if what if what if singles uh, rogue. And what if uh, Granger um, uh, seizes Granger Harmon seizes the government? And this is either Professor Gilbert or Janet or or um, Rowley. Well, you know, Ron. I mean, I like to just add a few things here based on the observation and comment. I don't know, Dr. Mahabir, can you see that I'm trying to get in? Get yes, some, yes, I saw that, and I was going to give you the opportunity. Can you just identify okay. yourself, your name, or uh, where yes, you're from, yes, or so? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is Cliff Rajkumar here. I'm from oh, Toronto. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, it's quite um, listening to all the different speakers and the perspective is quite refreshing and enlightening. And I think we're all trying to have um, play this out and see where this is all going. It is very clear, however, as we can see that um, the puppet master here is Granger. In spite of what we think, Lowing Field, um, and any of the other players, Harmon, et cetera, I think the key person here that has to make this decision as to what they intend to do in terms of honoring the constitution is Granger. I think he is really the puppet master. I think I've been watching and, and, and observing. Of course, I've played a little bit of a role and to my own dismay or disgust, um, going back to 2015, I've listened to him. As a matter of fact, I once made a mention, I made mention to him, I said, uh, Mr. Granger, I think you have a very big role ahead of you. And I certainly hope that you would have taken some, some example or a lesson um, from some of the great leaders in the past. And um, hopefully that this would help you because when he came to Canada, you know, he kind of um, win many of us because he came with a progressive, futuristic um, outlook on Guyana of what he wanted to do. And it was very evident to what Ravi was saying and also um, Dr. Gibran. Immediately upon get from in getting into the position, he started to put his plays in play where he restructured the army, restructured the police, and made sure that he had his own people in every key position. And we can see now that this is all being played out. Even Claudette Singh, I'm sure she wants to do the right thing. But when you have a puppet master of the level of um, Granger, I think there's a certain element of fear. And I think the next thing that he did was bringing all the different people from within the army that he has as advisors, even Harmon. So I think these are some of the challenges. The question I think we have to look at is what pressure can we, when you say what happened if, is what can we do from within the diaspora, from the international community to make sure that we do not drop the ball, that we keep the pressure up. I think this is what we have to do. If you blink here, you're going to lose. We have to make sure that we stay on ball. We have to make sure that we are constantly making sure that this situation is highlighted globally and that we have the support of the global community to make sure that Guyana does not slip into a dictatorship. Because to lose that, fr that franchise is going to be a very devastating situation for Ghana. Because once it happens, it's going, to, it's going to take a very, very long time. And even within themselves, they're going to have infighting. And I think this is what we have to be careful now at this moment, is that we do not allow this to happen. Thank you. I think there's a heavy responsibility for, for all of us. Anyway, thank you very much. I just want to get my input. It's quite enlightening to listen to everyone because it's quite, the input is very, very good. Thank you. Thank so you. Uh, would any one of the speakers want to briefly respond? It has to be brief. 
Well, um, Kumar, I'd like to, if I might, may, might I ask Dr. Gibran to answer the question that was put before? Because I was on another program last night with ex-president Ramutar and then the head of the Barbies of the uh, Guyana uh, Chambers uh, and Professor Kamaraj. And Professor Kamaraj made the same point, and he called a name. He said a Granger for him to try to string it on and to go against explicit recommendations by the U.S. must have what he called a sponsor. And um, I would like uh, Professor Gibbons' take on this, since this, this is his area of expertise. Professor? Professor, are you there? Uh, yeah, you have to unmute. Um, uh, right, so I've... No, no, no. Right. <laughs> Uh, hold on. I mean, yes, go ahead now, Professor. Right. Um, a very good question. What if Granger should embark on such a course of action? He does not have a sponsor in China, and he doesn't have a sponsor in Russia. So where else can he turn? And certainly, he has become anathema to the United States. Um, being the puppet master, as Cliff Rajkumar mentioned earlier, um, I think he's smart enough to know when the game is over. And it is not dependent on him conceding. It's on Claudette Singh making a declaration. We cannot have two presidents at the same time. Now he can cause trouble saying that he is not going. And then there's gonna be more pressure on him to, um, to vacate his offices. But once Claudette Singh declares and her declaration is for uh, Irfan Ali and the PPP, there is nothing else Granger can do. Um, I don't think he would want to, to call upon the military to go and shoot their own people, the, the police force to lock up their own people. It will be utter chaos and confusion. And you know this Greek word for crazy? Um, it has a different meaning, you know, not someone just going pagal. You, you know, I think you guys are, are familiar with that Hindi term, pagal. Um, it's much more than that, when things are totally out of control. And I don't think he wants to go down that road. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is David Ang Bhagwan, and I'm speaking from Toronto, I'm from Guyana. Um, I really would like for us to address the question by um, uh, the gentleman from Toronto. I think his name is Cliff. Uh, these, he asked some vital questions, and these need to be addressed. Uh, what exactly can we do as uh, responsible citizens of the Caribbean? Uh, what can we do now, assuming that uh, things are not uh, ruled in favor of the PPP. What can we do now? What can we do after uh, the CCJ uh, decision is uh, made? And what if the chairman of GCOM, uh, what is not in favor of what we hope is the case? So um, yeah, uh, if Ravi Dev could perhaps um, address this question about uh, what can we do? As the gentleman pointed out, this is a very critical election, and uh, it's very, very important that something be, be done so that we, that democracy continues to be alive in Guyana. Well, well, let me just say that all eyes are upon the diaspora because the only power, the only force that can get Granger out is external force. He has played his game and within the end, COVID has helped him. 
and he has put, uh, he, so he doesn't need to declare a state of emergency. We already have a state of emergency where the police, my neighbor two doors down were playing music, they had a birthday party, you can come and shut them down. And so emergency powers are already in and you can jail people there. So internally, um, you, you don't have much, so it's outside. Now in 2018, uh, the American government articulated its policy towards the Caribbean uh, on three, three prongs, three, three legs of a, a tripod. And one of them is on democracy. And that is the formal policy of the United States. I'm not so fair with what the Canadian one is, but I am sure it's in that same vein based on pronouncements. I would say that all of you in the diaspora have to bring as much concentrated pressure on the powers that be outside to bring it to bear on the Guyana government. Money is going to be the key. And as Professor Gibran said, if we can have, because the, the Congressional Senate Foreign Relations Committee just issued their report three days ago, and they didn't mention anything about Guyana, they mentioned they are giving some money in, for example, in Bolivia. And we were looking to see if they will have, you know, done something for, towards Guyana, nothing there. So I think pressure must be brought to bear upon those levels. In the last meeting we had, Diego Sain from Trinidad made the same comment that he asked for uh, representation for protests in front of the UN. The UN also has powers in terms of uh, uh, the democratic rights. CARICOM has powers through the Charter on Civil Society. So Guyana is now a signatory to several international treaties that can be invoked for pressure to be brought upon them. So America, for example, doesn't have to be the ugly American anymore to invade. There are other methods, including the one that Professor Gibran said. So I would like to say that at this juncture, all that you can do to mobilize outside, write your congressmen, write your senators, send your, your, your officers in, in, in Canada to bring some pressure to bear. Thank you. Uh, um, that's, somebody? That's very, uh, Mark, can I add to that? Okay. They, uh, they, Mark, they, can I add to that? Okay. Uh, but they wanted to say okay. something uh, quite a while, but okay. I have okay. to unmute him. Um, okay. Put him on. Yeah. Dave, you have to Put unmute, unmute, because, all right, go ahead, Tara, until he sorts himself out. Um, to this gentleman from Canada, I'm sure he's aware that under Randy Dipu, we did a petition drive to impose sanctions on about 15 identified individuals in the government. And that was handed on to the um, U.S. Ambassador in George and forwarded to U.S. Secretary of State. Secondly, we have contacted several Congress people already, and they have issued letters. The last for, from the Foreign um, Foreign Relations Committee, um, headed by Senator Rubio. Those things they didn't come by magic. It comes as a result of the pressure and our concern, calling their office, sending letters, etc. So that is an ongoing process. And today, the Indian uh, Diaspora Council started a petition drive asking for support to submit this again for the preservation of democracy and the will of the people be honored, et cetera. That, most of you will probably get copies of that from the Indian Diaspora Council. That was something just released. And there's uh, uh, the other... Um, plans are afoot and we got to work with them. As Ravi said, money is wanting and I have joined with a few others to raise some money to, um, to get professional help in this area, strategic help we need. And that is being done as well. But not everything is publicized, is in the public domain, but we are working on that privately to get some stuff done. Okay, Dave. Uh, yes, quickly, uh, because we are uh, uh, pulling up. We are pulling up on the program. Yes, go ahead. You are folding up. We may as well fold up at this time. We are the tailor. Well, I think, uh, Mr. 
Now, Mr. Devan Bhagwan had brought it up over and over a couple of times that are we here to define the problem? Really, we have defined the problem 40 years ago in New York. And I think we are looking for solutions. I think the last um, meeting we had, we defined the problem. We are looking for a way forward, an action plan. And I think we are at a very, very delicate point in time. We are looking for action. And uh, Tara, just to mention to you that uh, while we engage in small cells, we must go in a concerted effort to address the Congress and the Senators. Uh, there have been recent successes by a small group in Washington where they will get 20 senators to sign up a statement on certain issues. And it's not impossible for us to get some of the influential Congress. But I, can, I think we can get out a, a New York State senator, uh, well, uh, a senator of New York uh, State, can be very influential. But I think we have a tremendous leverage in, in America. We are not using it. And I wish to see this group, August group of people, we go out there and use the influence we have. Uh, we can, this is a small problem to address because right now in the State Department, Secretary of State, a number of positions they have taken already. All we need, uh, the news that I get out of London, which just came out, the money that's being held right now, Exxon is looking for direction. Hess has decided to withhold operations until they get some clear signal. And if we allow this, and I will, uh, circular newsletter out in the UK, to all of you I have in my mailing list. We, uh, we, are, we are sitting on the, on the fence, either we'll tilt one way or the other, and if we sit here docile and start still defining the problem, we'll get nothing done. I'm sorry to say that, but we must act. Yes, very good point. Uh, Janet, uh, we yeah. want to get a response Mark? from Janet. Yeah, yes, okay, Dool, and then Janet, we'll get a response from her. Yeah. I, I want to make, yeah. I, I want to I want to raise the question of soft power, soft power and to civil society. I mean, I want to congratulate the PVP. They're doing an XC challenge by the Granger government. But I would like to ask the question: Where are the other voices? The Chamber of Commerce. Uh, religious bodies. I was happy to hear the Muslims in Ghana speak out. I have not heard from a single Hindu organization. The Lawyers Association, all right, if you have writers, union, and so on. And I think that uh, uh, a lot of us, I, I listened to Dave talking about uh, meeting people in Congress and so on. But I think that we here have to organize ourselves all right, to fight our battles. We cannot forever expect that the US will help us. Okay, the US remove us from power in the 60s and so on. You all know that. Mm -hmm. They made it difficult for Ghana to rule and so on. So my humble suggestion is that uh, we need to see the role of civil society. All right, or what are, uh, and by extension, the role of soft power. I think that if you believe that power is just military power, I think Kublai Khan and Impalas would have still been ruling, and so many militaristic regimes would have still been ruling the world. Power is not just military power, what Granger wields. And I am saying that uh, a lot of our professionals and so on, they are failing the community, okay? And business people and so on. That's my contribution. Thank you. Okay, Janet, we haven't heard from Janet. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I would like to uh, make a comment on, um, in, you know, pressure from the diaspora is very important. And uh, Ravi Dave spoke about this. And, um, you know, um, Mr. Singh also spoke about this. Tara Singh spoke about this. Is that from March 2nd onwards, we have been actually very active. We had a protest on March the 8th in Toronto, and we had uh, close to a thousand people came out uh, and supported us in demanding, protesting against, you know, what was going on in Guyana, calling for democracy to prevail. We were so afraid of losing democracy, especially after decades of fighting for it. And we have written letters to the prime minister, um, calling for even the Carter Center to return, which they've refused. 
we, we've done a lot of um, letter writing to members of parliament and we continue to have a, a Facebook page called Guyana Democracy Under Threat um, and people are voicing their opinions and speaking out. The great thing about social media is it's allowing a platform to allow international um, support and pressure to be to be you know to be put on the and Guyana and to put on APNU and PNC as to what's going on. I, I saw uh, many many people have written that there was a time in the 60s, 70s and 80s people found ballot boxes in trenches. They were destroyed. They saw someone told me they saw their bo bo um, their ballot on the, on a on a on, on a, a, a walk path. So this is a time the 2020 election. Um, it's the biggest fight. We never expected this bullying, this, uh, you know, um, fight to hold on to power. And I must have to say that um, the PPP and uh, in opposition and other parties and um, citizens, in fact, democracy, fighting for democracy in Guyana, never seen that before. So people are actually empowered. They're doing something. Um, we are actually seeing it's, there's a limitation because of the pandemic, but had it not been for the pandemic, there would have been a lot more going on. And, and, and so we have to improvise, we have to find ways to overcome the fact that pandemic is preventing us from being out there. Um, and that, but now that things are loosening up, we can, we can start thinking about that. We can start thinking about social distancing and protesting. That's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, like, uh, Kumarji, yeah, I, know, just go ahead. Duel, I just want to bring, clarify something. I don't know if Duel was talking about uh, groups within Guyana, because for sure in Guyana, a private sector commission has been in front of leading for democracy. And these are individuals who are putting themselves and their business in risk, if you know the nature of the PNC, but they have stood up the Guyana, the Joshua Chamber of Commerce, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, all of them, the Hindu Dharmic Sabha, the um, Guyana Central Islamic Organization, uh, the Irish Samaj, they have all come out and spoken vociferously up. So I don't know, Dool, if you were speaking about within Guyana or outside of Guyana. I'm not too uh, aware of what is happening in Guyana. You know, there's a lot of come here. Yeah, and, but and, and, I know in, in, in Trinidad, we have not had, let's say, even our pol the opposition has fa failed to make a statement on Guyana. All right. Okay, and, next. Uh, uh, yeah. uh -huh. Kumar, I have a quick question here. Yes, go ahead. For, um, my name is Sam Subramani from Florida. Yes. A um, good friend of mine, um, Ravi Dev, as well as Dr. Gibran. But for Ravi, um, I know something is going to happen. Uh, very close, uh, very soon in the, with this uh, CCJ um, uh, ruling. Wednesday. Are the Guyanese people, and I hate to say this openly, prepare for this, what the, the effects and what will happen? I mean, we know the Indian people are very, you know, low key and they're that, they, they, they're vibrant and they, in terms of uh, the fighting type. But I don't know, serious things going to happen in Guyana based on past history. What is the climate there, Ravi? Well, the climate is one of apprehension. There's no question about that. Because while history never repeats itself identically, uh, Mark said the first was tragedy, the second time was farce. But we, there, there is that expectation that if the PNC doesn't get what it's won, it will resort to bullyism. So there is that um, concern in, but I must say, that the political leadership, uh, not only by the PPP, which of course uh, is leading the charge, but by the smaller parties, to the great delight of all Guyanese, these smaller parties, which um, overwhelmingly are manned and womaned by young people, they've picked up the charge and they are going with it. So there's something new brewing in Guyana here where the old politics, you know, um, said that you, when, when Graham, she said the, 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 um, the new isn't, the old is dead, but the new isn't born yet, and you have a period of uncertainty. I think that's where we are right now, because the new is that Ghana is now a nation of minorities. They can't say 
Indian people alone is giving PPP victory that is an Indian party. Similarly, the PNC, to its credit, if it were to win free and fair, it did get the support from Indians brought in by AFC. So all of this now has to be taken to the people. And that is where people like myself, who are, are working at the grassroots level, to talk to people, uh, to, to talk this language, that we will have to reach out across the divides. For example, we can't pretend that the PNC doesn't have support. The same 42% it got in 1964, the same percentage it's getting today. So uh, both sides have to talk. We have to ensure and address the fears of the African Guyanese community, which by and large still votes for the PNC. The, 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 the mixed votes you're getting crossover. So we have to do all of those things within Guyana to lessen the temperature. But the temperature is rising. And there's a lot of hot heads out there, especially from some uh, abroad. So to answer your question directly, yes, there is that trepidation as to what will happen going by history. But there is a lot of work going on uh, to emphasize this change of demographics, where we are saying that if the PNC were to become a normal party, it could win elections by doing the same thing that the PP has done, which is to reach across the divide. Right. Thank okay, you, so we, we're thank going to you have for some. All that you do. We're going to have some final uh, questions now or comments or contribution. Anybody? Uh, so a Kumar. new 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 face and uh, a new voice. Yes, uh, Professor Gopal. Yeah. Hi, Namaste. Namaste. Hey, all, this is Gopal Arora from India, and uh, well, I represent an organization, Antarashtriya Sahyog Parishad, which is. Uh, Indian Council for International Cooperation and we have been working in the field of diaspora for more than four decades and uh, Mr. Ravi Dev and uh, Professor and Dev, I have been hearing you. It's very early morning from India and I think the crux of the issue as Dev rightly pointed out was uh, what should be the action plan. So to my mind there are three fronts you know on which uh, you have to take this up. One is on the legal front CCJ, I heard the proceedings. I am very optimistic and I believe that uh, the judgment on Wednesday will be in favor of PPP because that is the sense of the court that I could get. The second front is the international pressure. Fortunately, uh, you see all the uh, governments, including my Indian government, because we have been taking up uh, this matter with them. I myself met the external affairs minister and only after that, you know, the uh, ministry issued a statement uh, in uh, favor of, uh, you see, a credible uh, election result in uh, Guyana. We have been sensitizing the uh, people here. We have been writing articles. Uh, last week itself, an article appeared, you know, uh, in the Guardian uh, newspaper. We have been writing in magazines also. Third front that uh, I feel which is very important is what is happening within Guyana. Now to my mind in this kind of a situation in which the democracy itself is at stake, the people of Guyana, they need to be sensitized and see that they have to go beyond the party lines because see, when the sanctions come and this time I believe that if Granger continues with this uh, you know, autocratic uh, uh, methods, then the sanctions will fall. Now, who is going to lose? Not only the Indian diaspora people. See, all Guyanese will lose. So they have to think beyond the party lines now. Now, that kind of a narrative also needs to be pushed. So this is my contribution, you know, which I would like to say that whatever is being done, this is commendable. But then you also need to add to that to create a narrative in Guyana that no, it is not about the race. It is not about, you know, uh, only the Indian diaspora. It is not about PPP. It is about Guyana, about the people of Guyana, about the well-being of Guyana. So that is an addition, you see, which my uh, humble contribution. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Um, any uh, final comments? Questions, yeah, contributions. I'd yeah. like to make a comment that uh, I think everybody agrees that reaching across the aisle 
is is uh, is very desirous, and and I think um, this is something that uh, our Jack Deal has said himself that the party is looking to expand the base and um, it's attracted people from outside and so on. Uh, but but the question is on the other side there there's a no, a bunch of unprincipled uh, virulent liars. How do you sit, sit across the table from from people like like those? How do you sit across the table and negotiate with people like those? They're, they're no, no talking as as a way through the back door of um, power sharing. So in and and um, this guy Heinz has gone as far as saying that uh, the executive power sharing should be um, should be on the based on the percentage of votes. <laughs> I, I, I think what he has in mind is is for Granger to get the first term of this. Uh, you know, he said the six the six month term would be prorated on the basis of number of votes. So let's say the PPP gets uh, a thirty, um, uh, PNC gets twenty eight, and the uh, joint parties get two. Um, uh, first of all, this is just letting uh, uh, these people who have taken Guyana to the brink through the back door. But secondly, you you have you are you're now going to sit down um, with people at the table who 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 I I you know would go so far as say are criminal. Um, we have we we have um, uh, Harmon, we have uh, Granger. We have Valda Lawrence. We have um, Williams, who goes to the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice and tells lies about massive uh, election fraud. Um, you know, reaching across the aisle is good if you've got decent people across the other side. I would say the first thing that has to be done is the PNC has to clear up their own house internally um, even before any one of these things are, are really approached. And, 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 and so what I would be looking for is the, 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 the PPP to be, um, for Earth and Ali to be sworn in as the legitimate president of Guyana. The PPP settles down uh, to government that they start to look at, you know, there's a lot of talk about constitutional reform, but as far as I can see, based on this CCG case, the constitutional is working fine. It's the people outside that are, that are, that are throwing up all sorts of roadblocks. And so you could have the, the very best of constitutions and nothing, it, it, it wouldn't make any difference. So I, I think what we are looking at first is, is um, to get the PPP in, into, into government and for, for them to reach out and so, and so on. But I think the onus should be on the PNC to, to clean up the, the party of these rogues that they have in there. And then you could sit down and have a, a, a conversation with reasonable people on the other side. So far, what we, we've seen is these people are, are, are on, on reasonable they are they are liars, um, uh, you know, unbelievable lies. Uh, take take an example of the Ashman Building, where where the cameras are there, and and, and they claim that P PPP rushed the building. There, there was a cameras were there when Mingo tried to um, uh, rig the, the election, and yet. They, they, they're refuting this, so I don't want to take any more time. But Thank what you. I'm what I'm basically saying is the other side has got got to clear up their act first. Right. Thank you. One final question or comment from somebody might, new. From, from somebody if new. If I might, I want to say something that Juan okay. has raised. Which is, yeah. I sure. think we are allowing a, a, a certain renegade band to define the conditions. There is no need for power sharing in Guyana. When I came back in the eight, late eighties. We had a majority, an inbuilt majority Indians that could have given the PPP uh, power uh, uh, in perpetuity, they said. Fine, 
you need to get African Guyanese into government by some effort, because you, you cannot exclude any group in perpetuity. But the demographics have now changed. The, the, if, if it's only Indians voting for PPP, Indians are now around 35% of the population. It means that the PPP got 53%, which the numbers showed. They got a heck of a lot of crossover votes. The PNC did the same thing. We shall be don't need a theory here. In 2015, the PNC, there are some questions, but they got into power electorally. It means that they were able to do it. How were they able to do it? In coalition. They got crossover votes through the coalition. It was David Granger by destroying the industry, firing 7,000 Indians, and kicked Moses Nagamutu and Ram Jitan in the face. Whether they liked it is another matter, but the point is, and that they destroyed that crossover vote. And that is why they lost by and large, by doing all the things, alienating their own people, by not doing what they promised, giving themselves raise in the past. So we gotta get off this power sharing nonsense. Right now, Guyana is at a point where each of the major parties, we, we have to concede, they both have their blocks, ethnic blocks, but neither ethnic block can allow them to win. So at long last, we have reached the promised land where we have what is called that shifting vote, that swing vote that can go either way. So why don't we give it a chance? The PPP gets uh, elected. And people like myself have to ensure, all of us, to ensure they do the right thing by not being discriminatory, by, you know, all the things they're accused of, by governing fairly. And let us have now embark on a new path for Guyana. But the PNC in its present leadership, I agree with you, they, I don't see them doing it, but that is a question for their base to address. We can only reach out, and that is why we don't have to talk at the top only. I live in Eiffel, it's a mixed village. We can talk to our own people, each one of us individually and as groups, talk across the divide. Let us show them that we are Guyanese people, and with the oil money that's coming, we can criticize the Exxon contract wherever we want, but there is enough money from the 14% that can make us do a lot of things so all Guyana can raise. Today I heard Mia Mockley talk in Barbados about the, the, the raising the floor. That's what we can do in Guyana. The, we can raise the floor and, and get everybody at a higher level. And let's not depend on this elite power sharing, which is just a bunch of them want to get their hands on wealth. Can I right. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, someone. Yes, yes. Last uh, question. Yeah. Um, can you identify yourself, please, and say where you are from? Oh, this is this is Professor Gibran. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I no. There's a guy, uh, Budrani. Budnarine. 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 Yes, yeah, sorry. Budnarine T. Hall. I'm from the William. Oh, okay, Iraq, great, great. I live, in, I live in Florida now. Okay. My, my, I'm still concerned about if the PNC, APNU, AFC get their way and they don't want to come out of the government um, and they get the police, which they, the police is on their side to prevent the swearing in and, and to sustain them and keep them in government. What can the PPP do? Okay, so we are folding up now with final words from Professor and maybe Tara and maybe Janet and Ravi Dev. Uh, just one minute each. All right, um, I'll take the, the first crack at it. One of the things that, uh, that we are not paying much attention to, well, uh, and, and that of course is because of the press of what we are faced with right now, meaning the political impasse. Um, regardless of what happened and which party gets into power and form the government, and if they don't pay careful attention to climate change and what is going to happen, remember the coastland of Guyana is below sea level. That narrow strip of land is not capable of, uh, it doesn't have the carrying capacity for that population. And they have been total neglect almost um, over the years in terms of keeping the system of irrigation, uh, you know, so on and so forth that the Dutch left us. 
Why is it Parimaribo, which is also below sea level, does not have that problem? And yet Georgetown and other places in Guyana has that problem or the coastline. Uh, my take is this, regardless who is in power, climate scientists have revised their time frame. They're not looking at 100 years, 150 years anymore after what happened in 2018 in the Arctic Sea, melted and what happened in Greenland for the first time. Massive melting. Okay, the, their revised timeline is 10 years, 20 years. Maybe in 20 years, Guyana might cease to exist as we know it right now, unless they take steps bringing some Dutch engineers who understand more than anyone else, any group of people on this planet, because they have done it and they are doing it continuously. They live under constant threat, yet they have been able to master this in their homeland or Holland. What Guyana needs to do is start thinking and then start making plans and bring the Brazilians in because they have done this already. Move the capital and large numbers of people off the coast of Guyana into the hinterland area, probably uh, the, um, the hilly sand and clay belt region, you know, as we were taught in geography. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Tara, yes, uh, unmute your mic, please. Unmute. Yeah, you're, you're here now. Right. No, no, you, you mute it again. You had it right just now, a second ago. Right, yeah. you were here, you were, yeah. Yeah, I just want to make some comments. Um, I support what a gentleman is saying about negotiating with these um, people from the PNC cabal. I mean, it's very hard to negotiate with people who are so committed. As I said, they develop a culture of lies, deception, banality, and rigging. And it's very hard for people who are decent to come and sit on the same table to share similar values. Now, the gentleman just raised, the Professor Gibran just mentioned about climate change. But right now, the economy in Ghana is almost, has almost collapsed. Uh, the poverty level has increased from 36% to about 40% right now. And the unemployment has shifted has increased from 14% to over 20%. Uh, many people are on the verge of starvation. It's compounded with the COVID-2 and the restrictions that I can tell. Um, we have had to do a number of um, feeding programs, selling food hampers, several groups from New York and both in Guyana as well, and other countries, Canada, have had to do these programs to help alleviate the harsh, the harshness of um, the the regime as well as COVID imposed upon these people, and I will encourage anybody to help as much as possible. Um, shortly, we will be doing a food hamper program in Saint Cuthbert's Mission of the Mahika River, where we intend to pro provide two, three hundred food hampers to three hundred families up there at a mission, an Amerindian mission. They are very hard pressed because they depend heavily on logging and the logging industry is almost crushed. Every single industry in Ghana has collapsed with the exception of gold. And now, had it not been for oil, we would have been in a more terrible state. But how the oil wealth is distributed, that is another problem. But we are in serious economic. And just one final point. In 2015, when the government took over, the PNC government, we had $15 billion in gold reserve. Now is less than one billion, seven hundred something million, and the deposits at the bank, private deposits at the bank, were about fourteen to fifteen billion. Now is minus ninety something billion dollars, and non-performing loans, everything has expanded, has increased. People are unable to pay off the debt. So the, the indicators in Guyana, economic indicators are pointing a very dismal situation. And the longer this continues, the worse it will get. Thank you. Closing remarks by Janet and then Ravidev. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Mahavir. Um, I would like to just express some, some concerns about, um, you know, well, I'm predicting that the PPP will be declared the winner and Earth and Ali will be sworn in. And, and the concern I have is the potential uh, riots and destruction by the opposition, by the current government and their supporters. Uh, you know, for women and children and, you know, innocent people who are working and how they're going to be secure. I'm, I'm really concerned about that and what the p role of the police um, will be when this happens. That we've seen in the past how burning and looting and destruct destruction has taken place. But we've seen in 2015, PPP um, did not have any of its supporters go out there and do any destroying. and looting and, and, and so on. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. I hope that some measures will be put in place for people to be protected against being attacked and killed even, robbed, you know. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, uh, final remarks? Well, as I, uh, to answer to your question and to Jan Janet's concern also, uh, yes, in Guyana here, I'm in Eiffelet, um, and throughout the coast, uh, you go to wakes, you go to weddings, you go to jandis, you go to Quran Sharif. Um, this is what the ordinary man and woman in Guyana, they're concerned about. But what gives me hope is that there's a lot more conversation at the local level between ordinary peoples. And the ordinary, just like the ordinary Indian, when Tara talks about the poverty level rising, the poverty level among afro Guyanese rises even steeper because traditionally the Indian had other resources in terms of gardens and going fishing and uh, many other alternative methods of securing food. So at this juncture, for example, the little group that I'm, I work with, we have shared over 1,700 hampers throughout Guyana. We ensure we share across the communities to show that we care for each other. This conversation that I am trying to be part of that I thought David Hines would be willing to go along with when he, I think, betrayed the whole thrust of it, that we must talk at the grassroots level and talk to each other that all of us will be harmed. And if we can just have a stable government, the money that's coming, it is not uh, it is, can be a win-win situation at long last. And because we have to accept that afro Guyanese have fears, and these are real fears, because culturally has led to structural changes where it is very more difficult for them to be in this situation. And we have to reach out and we have to talk and walk together. And that is my proposal, that those of you in the diaspora also, must support this kind of work. When you do come into Guyana or send things to Guyana, ensure or insist that whatever help you send goes across the divide and that we can all show that we are one people and stop this small elite bunch of thieves and robbers to divide us once again. Thank you. Um, uh, Dool, before I bring the curtains down, you want to say anything? Hanuman? Okay. Um, so, Dr. Mahapir, I was wondering if you don't mind, this is Cliff Rajkumar again. Yeah. If given the fact that we have this group of very concerned people yeah. who certainly wants to play a more active role in participating in what is happening right now, is it possible that you can be the facilitator to sure, share sure, sure. the email so that we can, because maybe some of the initiative that Tara spoke about with the hampers. I like to participate. We can raise some funds here in Canada. Also, I like to support um, Ravi Dave's initiative also. So there's a number of things we can do. And aside from the political activist part of it, we, can, we have to be also involved in the social aspect. And I think we have a very, from what I can see here, um, a very concerned group and a very involved group. And I think it would be good if we can maybe form something out of this. And, and then in closing, I like, from my part, I'd like to say thank you very much for facilitating this and for making this happen. And I think this is very enlightening and I think it was very much needed. And I think your contribution to Guyana, as I 
pointed out in my email to you is really very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, th but this is a team effort. Um, as I say, we have an organization, ICDN, which is a free online newspaper. But I'd like to stay in touch with all of you and keep all of you on my mailing list. So if you can contact me at my email address, uh, most of you have my email address, or just go on the website, ICDN Indo-Caribbean Diaspora News, um, you have uh, our WhatsApp um, numbers. Contact us so that we can build a database and we, we can work together. So um, thank, thank, uh, thanks to all of you who have stayed on until um, 20 past 9 p.m. here in Trinidad. Um, for the rest of the month or so, we are not going to address Guyanese issues again because we have an election in Trinidad and Tobago on August 10. And for the next few weeks, we are going to be addressing the political issue. We are in campaign season now. And um, it is very likely that next Sunday, we are going to get a representative from all the political parties on this forum to have a meeting. And we want them to respond to the question, what are your party's plans to support and promote Indian culture in Trinidad and Tobago? That's the question, that's the team. And if that party was in power, what have you done in your last term to support and promote Indian culture in Trinidad and Tobago? So I thank all of you for being here and um, we will be in touch by email. Send me your email, you have my email or WhatsApp us, we, uh, our ICDN. I mean, you can write um, letters and comments and so on. And this, uh, pro, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we are going to edit it and uh, upload it on YouTube. And it's, we are also going to post it on our Facebook page. So thanks to everyone and Th have a- Th Thanks Kumarji and Namaskar. Thank Namaskar. you. Right, Namaskar. and thanks all of Thank you, who, you. Are, who are from India and elsewhere. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kumar. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.